Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Kieran. With me, as always, is Austin Davidson. Heyo. Today we're going to be recapping the Pittsburgh Steelers' 31 to 27 win over the Baltimore Ravens, clinching the AFC North division and locking them into the number three seed on a lovely Merry Christmas holiday. And I wanted to wish all of our listeners a Merry Christmas. Austin, how is the beginning of Hanukkah for you, and how is Christmas? And uh, how did you uh, enjoy watching the game? Uh, oh, Christmas is great. Christmas is great because of uh, the game. It really finished off well, and Hanukkah is pretty good. How was your Christmas? Well, uh, I was able to spend it with my mom, and we got to go to the game. As you already know, it was certainly a wonderful game to be at. It was an electric crowd. And certainly, it was definitely a uh, once-in-a-lifetime experience, I think you could say. It was definitely a great uh, Christmas for me. Um, so, it was actually uh, so electric at the game, the crowd was going wild at the end, that uh, Roethlisberger was uh, routinely having to try to quiet down the crowd. You could tell it was ready to explode before that uh, final touchdown. After that, it certainly did. So, it was definitely... A crazy game to be at and it was a lot of fun uh more uh more on the game uh it was just uh it was really special to go to my mom i go with my mom i already mentioned uh that she's probably the biggest reason that i became a fan uh first of all and we had never seen the steelers play together in person so it was definitely a great game to go to and uh the steelers winning was just the icing on the cake especially with the type of game it was uh, more on the game. It was definitely a classic Steelers Ravens game. The game with the playoff spot on the la- on the line came down to the wire, but early on in the beginning, it looked like the Steelers were in control. A good defensive series to open up the game, followed by an 87-yard touchdown scoring drive on offense that was punctuated by a big-time throw and catch by Ben Roethlisberger to Xavier Grimble put the Steelers in front seven to nothing. What were you thinking at this point of the game, Austin? Uh, my first thought was that. Uh Steelers were doing good. Uh, there's, there was a tight end stepping up in Ladarius Green's place and giving it at least to A.B., so that was good, in uh, Grimble. Also just felt like a great easy drive downfield that was all smooth sailing. It didn't feel like there was anything really going wrong yet, and it, it was a nice way to start the emotional roller coaster that was this game. What did you think? Well, it was uh, after watching that first drive, it felt like we were going to score on every single drive. Uh, The key of that drive, while uh, there was a penalty in that big catch by Grimble, the main uh, cog in that drive was Le'Veon Bell. After only managing 32 yards in uh, Week 9 in Baltimore, he had 39 alone on that first drive. He was physical right out of the gate on on his first run, running over Zachary Orr, and uh, it seemed like the Steelers were letting out some frustration that had been uh, pent up from the past four losses that many of them they felt they should have won. Uh, following that, the, however, the Steelers uh, really struggled to get anything going offensively. The defense, while not great, was a, uh, was bending a little bit, but they didn't break too often. They got a break in the second quarter. A timely botched snap on a Justin Tucker field goal kept the Steelers ahead 7-6, to six, and they took that lead into halftime. Uh, more on Justin Tucker. We already know how great of a kicker he is, and uh, I was watching from... Uh, from my seat in warm-ups, and yes, it's warm-ups, but he actually made a 72-yard field goal with about five yards to spare. Um, I, I didn't expect him to miss any kicks today, so definitely that botch snap was a huge, uh, a hugely uh, successful thing for the Steelers. Going into halftime with the Steelers up one point, I felt like the defense had played well, but I was really concerned with the performance of Ben Roethlisberger and more specifically the wide receivers. Um what did you think, Austin? Uh, I really thought at this point it was going to be a regular Steelers-Ravens game, uh, a, a low-scoring defensive battle. Of course, I was wrong but because uh, second half it came out firing on both sides, but the Steelers had a lot of momentum after the botched field goal by the Ravens. Since the Steelers got the ball coming out of half, I was thinking about how the Steelers needed to capitalize on the first drive and get some more points on the board before the Ravens could catch up. So... That, that, those are my thoughts. I uh, completely share your thoughts on that matter. I was thinking it throughout of half throughout halftime, the type of adjustments they could have made to try to 
get back on the board to start the second half. And what happens? The first uh, play from scrimmage, Roethlisberger throws an untimely pick deep in his own territory uh, that was immediately converted into a touchdown pass from Joe Flacco to Steve Smith. And then the two-point conversion also to Steve Smith, which gave the Ravens a uh, 14-7 to lead. And right then, well, that, that definitely didn't feel good. I uh, uh, Things started to break down a little bit. The Steelers were able to come back and get another field goal punctuated, or I guess highlighted by a long t- catch and run by Eli Rogers before he ran into the kicking net on the Steelers' sideline. Uh, the teams traded field goals, but once again, Roethlisberger made a poor decision throwing to a double-covered Jesse James that was picked off and it set up a Ravens field goal. It was 20-10 to 10 at the end of the third quarter. It really didn't feel like, uh, it really, you didn't feel good being in that stadium. It was nice uh, for the Ravens. It was really quiet. Uh, what was it like watching on TV at that point? Oh, it was, it was bad. I, I got that stomach-sinking feeling. I was like, oh, no, it's over. I was like, I was like, ah, oh, the, the worst has happened because when he when uh, Ben spun around and clearly missed CJ Mosley, it was just, it was so bad. Uh, it felt like momentum was completely in the Ravens' hands, and they were uh, they were already up twenty to ten, and it felt like Ben was really struggling in this quarter uh, compared to the other qu- quarters. I didn't think he was going to come back. I didn't think he was going to come back and do well after this. Absolutely. That resiliency was something that was evident, however, from the very first play of the first quarter, or sorry, fourth quarter. The Steelers' offense definitely turned it on in the fourth quarter. They scored 21 of their 30, or yeah, 21 of their 31 points in that quarter, using Bell, Le'Veon Bell a little bit more at times. However, most of the last couple of drives came down to quick passes that utilized the, the middle of the field. <clears throat> I think that was definitely the key difference in the passing game on Christmas Day after they took the lead on a touchdown by Bell on a nice uh, improvisation by him and Roethlisberger the Ravens drove down the field and converted four third downs along the way and scored a go-ahead touchdown thanks to I think his name is Kyle is his first name Kyle is it Juzek the fullback yeah it's Kyle he made a uh, gravity defying play when he broke a tackle of Mike Mitchell and dove into the end zone At that time, I was thinking, uh, all I could think about was the Dallas game and just how it felt like this game was mirroring that game in so many ways. But this time, it felt like the Steelers were on the other end uh, of the spectrum, and they had the chance to win it this time. What were you thinking before that last drive, Austin? Uh, Honestly, I was thinking shout-out to um, Kyle Juszczyk for powering through that because if he was going to score, which he got down, if he got down to the one, I would have been pissed off because they would have just melted the clock really, really hard, and there would have been about 30 seconds, like probably 20 seconds left maybe. But uh, So shout-out to him for actually powering through and probably uh, save the Steelers. And also shout-out to Mike Mitchell for having poor tackling at the right time, I guess. But um, <laughs> anyhow, well, continuing the shout-outs. Oh, sorry, were you going to say No, no, go, go right ahead. Oh, okay. Shout out to Demarcus Ayers for making the catch he needed to and getting out of bounds. He only had one catch for nine yards, but that's all was after him, and I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, um, shout out to Ben for climbing back up from the third quarter to throw like a monster for the clutch, and of course shout out to Antonio Brown for just doing Antonio Brown things where a, a normal receiver is stuffed, he gets a touchdown, and all all I could think is down year. Just that goes on my head. Everyone's like. Tony Brown's having a down year, and like our uh, Steelers receivers down year is your best is your best receiver's good year. So <laughs> it's your best receiver's career year, more so. He yeah. has he has a hundred catches again. He has over a thousand yards. What was that? His twelfth or thirteenth touchdown? He's one touchdown away from the team record. So, I mean, gee, well, I think maybe it was fourteen, but in any case. That last drive, actually, I want to say Demarcus Ayers made a nice catch, but his biggest contribution, I think, came from a pass interference on the previous drive that put the Steelers in position to go ahead beforehand. But all I was thinking about with um, Chusek is that uh, the Steelers may have gotten a little lucky considering the fact that the Ravens scored when they did. Because you're right, they could have easily milked the clock when they did. And I'm not going to really blame Mike Mitchell for not uh, making the tackle on that play. 
because that's a huge fullback there, and he's uh, Mitchell's fighting a losing battle there, and Bud Dupree really needed to help him out when I was watching that. Uh, Dupree was really just sitting there when uh, Mitchell was fighting for his life before Jusek got in the end zone. But that final drive, it really I really wasn't too concerned because the Steelers only needed a field goal and had a minute and 18 seconds and two touchdowns, or sorry, two touchdowns, two timeouts to get uh, 55 yards because that would have gotten them to, I think, the 25, wait, let me think, to the 30-yard line, which would have been about a 47-yard field goal. And that's about as confident as I was in Boswell, about a 47-yarder, given the conditions on the field, the weather, and the fact that they were kicking towards the open end. Uh, But they moved down the field quickly. And the thing that was most impressive about that drive to me was the fact that guys like DeMarcus Ayers, guys like... Kobe Hamilton were making big time catches and big time plays when they needed to that drive had a little bit of everything it had the obviously uh it had some fantastic protection as the Ravens blitzed on I pretty much every play on that drive it had a couple of big catches by Jesse James and Antonio Brown moving the ball and then I think the the key play other than the touchdown one that not many people are going to remember uh first when they think about this game but the biggest catch, in my opinion, definitely had to be the full extension grab by Eli Rogers that put the Steelers, I think, inside the Ravens, I think, 30-yard line. I think that was when fans at the stadium started to think, maybe they can score a touchdown instead of going for a field goal here. Maybe they can actually go for the win instead of going for overtime here. And then, obviously, you don't, you need not say anything else other than it was just incredible what Antonio Brown did whatever you want to call it the the stretch the extension the immaculate extension whatever you want to call it it was simply a an iconic moment in this rivalry in this in the Steelers history and it was definitely a huge moment where the uh where the crowd and everyone just let loose on that play and if he doesn't score there I don't know if the Steelers are able to get off another play because the Steelers are out of timeouts there's nine seconds when he scores uh, listening to Ben Roethlisberger on the radio today, he said that if that had happened, they would not have uh, tried to rush the field, tried to spike it, and then rush the field goal unit on. He said they would have gone for a quarterback sneak. Uh, I just, I think that would have been interesting. I don't know if they would have, if they had gone for the spike, if they would have had enough time. But it's certainly interesting to think about. But Austin, this was the signature win of the season, don't you think? What a what are your thoughts on the game as a whole, real quickly, before you recap the offense a little bit? Um, it was, I want to say it's probably the biggest win of this year. It, it's it, It's got to be. I mean, Kansas City was a big one, but, I mean, it wasn't as powerful. It wasn't, it wasn't really sending the message. I mean, it, it, it was a great win against Kansas City, but I think this game, this game just felt like, this clinched the North. This clinched the playoffs. We had the playoffs in our hands right here, and we just took it and we, we went with it. So I, I think this is probably the best game of the year. There were definitely uh, better performances against uh, other teams, maybe even better performances against better teams, but considering the situation, it was essentially another playoff game. It was essentially the Steelers' first playoff game, if you want to think of it as that. Because if they lose, there's still a chance to make the playoffs, but it's Highly unlikely the Ravens are going to lose to the Bengals, who have already declared who already declared that AJ Green was not going to play in that game next week. But luckily for the Steelers, they took care of business, and now they have a nice uh, a nice Week 17 matchup against the Browns that has uh, no comp- uh, complications on the uh, playoff race. So now let's uh, let's look back at the way the Steelers played. What do you think about the Steelers' offense as a whole to, uh, for Christmas on Christmas Day? Uh, it was real. It was a roller coaster. Okay, so it got it started. Off, the first drive went really well, but uh, after that, it kind of cooled down until uh, halftime. And uh, going into uh, coming out of the half, it was really bad. Roethlisberger wasn't looking good. Roethlisberger obviously drew two picks in the third quarter. One was really bad to, to Zachary Orr, and uh, it just it. It, it clicked at weird times. Like, it didn't make sense, but there was uh, heroics in the beginning, and it finished as it started, so to speak. Uh, a combination of, like, Jesse James, Eli Rogers, and Bell ke- coming up big on the, uh, 
I didn't even say Antonio Brown. And Antonio Brown coming up big on the final offensive drive of the game. One of the uh, more uh, forgotten plays that really stood out to me was Jesse James' hurdles. It was amazing and athletic. I, I, I was, like, proud of him because lately I've been a little doubtful of Jesse James. And when um, Ben threw his second interception uh, to Jesse James, I was wondering what he was doing when he was throwing a Jesse James in double coverage. But, uh, I mean, he had a pretty good game. So, uh I don't think I could make fun of him after this. Well, I don't never make fun of him, but like pick on him, so to speak. He had a pretty decent game. And uh, anyhow, touchdowns by Le'Veon Bell on two uh, two back-to-back offensive plays, uh, offensive plays, offensive drives were really, really good in this uh, the fourth quarter. Uh, I think one was in the third, but were really good late. And um, it was just, I, I think. It, the best way to describe it is the uh, roller coaster that ended off well. It, it just it started well and ended well, and that's that's the best way to to explain to describe it. it. I yeah. mean, it burnt the immaculate extension. What do you think of the offense as a whole? Well, it definitely played the role of uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, going from that uh, roller coaster as you were talking about. But the uh, you might want to. If you were to give the Steelers' offense a grade, I'd I'd probably give it a B or B plus. You can't give a group an A for some for completely disappearing for two and a half quarters. However, they played their best when it mattered most. Despite long stretches of inconsistent play and then two bad interceptions by Ben Roethlisberger, everyone seemed to contribute in a big way. You need to look no further than the three the killer bees, the three stars. Le'Veon Bell only finished with 137 total scrimmage yards, which I'm saying is low, but that's only because he contributed 15 uh, receiving yards, which is low by his standards. But I've heard this narrative a lot this week, and I I can agree with it personally that he may have played his best game ever, maybe excluding the game in Buffalo a couple weeks ago that we were at, simply because when not much else was going right, he was doing everything, whether it was making some key blocks in the passing game, making some big runs out of nothing, getting hit in the backfield, then making a couple moves, juking out, and picking up some key first downs. He was clearly, in my opinion, I think he was the best Steelers player all, all game long. But then once the fourth quarter began, Ben Roethlisberger and Antonio Brown turned it around. They were clear and present in the fourth quarter. They had several key connections on the Steelers' final three drives. Obviously, none were bigger than Brown's game-winning touchdown, but he also had back-to-back 20-yard receptions on the previous drive and that last play. Of course, we have to talk about it. As a five foot ten wide receiver, what is he, a buck 90, something like that, he was stood up at the goal line by three uh, Ravens players, and he was smart enough to know the situation, know that if he gets tackled there, the game might end, the season might end, reaches with the ball over the goal line while he's being grabbed by the face mask, need I, uh, need I tell you, and gets the touchdown. Just simply one of the most iconic plays I think I've ever seen. It just it's it just screamed Heinz Ward to me, the kind of player Heinz Ward was, someone who had that nose for the end zone and just wouldn't be denied when he knew he had to score. And uh, finally, Ben Roethlisberger, he, did, he definitely didn't have his best day, but like I said, he played the best when it mattered most, making great and poised throws with the game on the line against a good t- uh, defensive team. And then, obviously, like I said before, it's important to not forget the key contributions of guys like Jesse James and Eli Rogers, Kobe Hamilton, Demarcus Ayers, particularly Rogers and James. I already talked about uh, Rogers' fantastic extension catch, but he also had several other key catches, including a catch that set up a field goal. And like we talked about, Jesse James with that incredible hurdle the dude is six foot seven and I've harped on him a lot at times this year but it, it is it is important for me to acknowledge when he has played well and he played really well particularly on that last those last couple of drives I think that was the key difference in the offense was being able to throw the ball in the middle I think that once the Steelers started doing that the offense opened up a little more we saw Brown get a little more involved and James was able to find the soft spot in the zone, something he hasn't really been great at this year, but really something the Steelers' uh, tight ends haven't done a great job of much of the year at all. But he was able to do it, I mean, besides Ladarius Green, but he was able to do it, and uh, it was definitely a big-time contribution for Jesse James. 
on the other side of the ball, uh, the defense. What uh, what what were your thoughts on the defense on Christmas Day? I kind of thought they regressed a little bit. Not that they didn't play well overall, but um, they had a really good first quarter, and then they kind of started falling apart going into the second. And they got out, coming out of the half. It was kind of it was bad. They probably missed to it a little bit. Uh, there was a lot of missed and unfinished tackles in this game especially in the second half, and it's, like I said, it looked pretty bad, but regardless, they had a pretty good day. Uh, not many penalties from what I can remember. I can't think of a uh, really big one. There was one, on, right now. there was one on Artie Burns on that second drive that led to that Ravens field goal. That was kind of bad, though, because Steve Smith sold that. Oh, was that, was that the bad, was that the ta- I, was that the Shazier? No. no, that was different, okay, but I know what you're talking about. The first one I was just talking about was the Ravens' second drive. It was right after the Steelers went down the field and scored. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, Artie Burns gave up a pass to, I think it was Steve Smith, yeah. And then Mike Wallace, or Mike Wallace, Mike Mitchell was going for the hit, missed the hit, and then he ended up running down the field. Cockrell and Burns shoved him out of bounds. Uh, Burns probably gave him an extra shove. You remember that? Yeah, you, you know why I'm confused? Because the announcers actually called... Not the announcers. The referee, uh, no, they yeah. called it on Cockrell, yeah. That was not the correct call. Yeah, they call. called it on Cockrell when it wasn't Cockrell. Um, yeah, there was that, and then there was a Shazier one, but it wasn't Shazier's fault. I didn't like that call. I don't think a lot of people liked that call. We were all confused but, at the stadium because we weren't... We had never... Well, at least we hadn't heard of a uh, pre-pass helmet-to-helmet hit like that. And the argument I heard is that, yeah, that's still a helmet-to-helmet hit and that that's going to be penalized. I do understand that, but when you see the play, Hughes check really can't be hit anywhere but the head. I mean, he's, like, crawling up into a ball to make sure that he has the ball and is, like, uh, falling forward. I don't really know what Ryan Shazier is supposed to do there. If he tries to nip at his feet, there's no guarantee he goes down there. So I don't really know what more you could have asked from Ryan Shazier there. Yeah, I, I, I don't blame him, but uh, continuing on, uh, one of the standout plays had to be Lawrence Timmons coming and nailing Joe Flacco for a sack. Jeez, they left the man unblocked, and he just ran over Flacco. It was great. That was a great play. What was the, what was the uh, stadium like when that happened? Oh, it was uh, It definitely uh, – they got up and got uh, really excited there. I know my mom was particularly uh, happy about that play because the Ravens were moving down the field pretty quickly on that play and they needed a big-time negative play, and that was the play they were looking for. It held, ended up resulting in a field goal attempt. I think that was the botch field goal attempt was what happened there. It was definitely a big-time sack they showed on the – I watched the broadcast when I got back home, or we did, and uh, you actually saw in the replay that the running back, I think it was Dixon, just completely missed the block. He went in the wrong hole. And Timmons was just, a, I know Flacco's a big man, but it's definitely not fun to see that big man, Lawrence Timmons, running uh, running at you full speed like that. Oh, definitely not. Uh, Bud Dupree got the only other sack in the game, I believe, so shout-out to him. And finally, shout-out to Shazier, who also had a pretty good day. He got the game-winning interception on Flacco. So, uh, overall, I think the defense did it's, it's almost like exactly like the offense. The defense and the offense both had like a roller coaster of a day where they didn't do they did bad at times and they did good at times. What do you think? Um, real quickly, I, I, I wasn't that impressed with the way Ryan Chazier played, at least for at parts during the, during the game. He got beat on a touchdown, and there was that penalty as questionable as it may be. I thought Lawrence Timmons was the Steelers' best defensive player. On that uh, on Christmas Day, do you agree with that, or is that do you do you think Shazier played? Because you could see replays and stuff like that. I just I saw more live things like that. I couldn't tell at times. Do you think Shazier played really well? Because I I thought he didn't play great. I thought he was okay. I think I I saw him get into the uh, backfield a lot, and maybe I'm factoring that in. But now that I think about it, he didn't really make tackles in the backfield. He kept missing tackles, so maybe it was, I think it was yeah. Lawrence Simmons probably that, had a better day. That's what I was thinking about. Shazier was getting in the backfield a lot, but there were the thing that was that bothered me mostly about this defense. I hate to blame them for what happened because 
it's it, while true they gave up 24 points and uh, they only had two sacks and that one takeaway, which was you know, I, I'm not going to say meaningless, but it was the last play of the game. Um, it doesn't look great on paper, but the other thing you have to consider is the fact that the Ravens had the ball for like almost 80 plays and the Steelers had the ball for only like 55. So the Ravens were on the field almost the entire game and you're adding into the, adding into account the fact that Stefan Tuitt was not playing. You had guys like Ricardo Matthews, Javon Hargrave, LT Walton, Daniel McCullers. They were all, or even uh, Maxi, that new guy they called up from the practice squad. I found out that uh, my friend Jaden at uh, school went to the same high school as he did. He graduated two years before him, so that's kind of cool. But, I mean, you're talking about guys that have – you only have two guys who have a legitimate NFL experience in uh, Ricardo Matthews and uh, Javon Hargrave from this year only. So I think considering the fact that they were on the field for so long – the defensive line played really well because you could tell they were getting tired at the end of the game. There were hole, The holes for the running backs were bigger by the end of the game. Excuse me, but uh, the one thing that keeps me from saying that it was great is the fact that they did give up 24 points and the fact that they were missing a lot of tackles. But obviously, uh, and you could tell that they, uh, they were pretty tired on that last drive. They had four key third downs that the Ravens converted <clears throat> and they, you're right, they definitely did regress as the game went along, but I think that you can't blame the defense for that. That I think you have to look at the offense and the way they performed from the uh, <clears throat> from like the five-minute mark of the first quarter until the fourth quarter. But obviously it was all good in the end with the Steelers winning and being locked up as the third seed now. So now they're going to host a playoff game for the first time since 2014. And... Now that week 16 has concluded, there's two possible opponents the Steelers are going to play. They're going to play the Miami Dolphins, who are without their starting quarterback, Matt Moore, <clears throat> who the Steelers lost to on the road. What was it? I think it was 30 to 15 uh, several months ago. Or the Chiefs, who the Steelers beat in week 4, 43 to 14. Austin, who would you, as a Steelers fan, rather see in the uh, playoffs? in the minority because Steelers Depot on Twitter ran a poll that I voted in and it showed that the Dolphins are the preferred. I am with the Chiefs because I know uh, the we beat them already with all their starters at Hines badly. It wasn't a close game. The Steelers all, almost had pitched a shutout giving up like 14 points I think right at the end like with five minutes to go. Yeah, it was, it was garbage time, yeah. Yeah, so I would rather just get it over with because I think it's the harder game and just not see a team we lost to already, even though I think this time we beat them uh, because they don't even have Ryan Tannehill starting a quarterback. But I also like the idea of if uh, the Dolphins beat Houston, they have to fight New England. And it's almost as if the Steelers were to meet the Ravens later in the playoffs. It's like a division game, and I think anything could happen. So possibly the Patriots could get knocked down by their own division in some freak accident game but that's just my thoughts what are you thinking you're right uh thinking back uh thinking back to another time the patriots were the one seed back in 2010 the St uh, the year a steelers team went to the super bowl the uh patriots hosted the six seed jets and they had beat down the jets i think it was like 45 to 3 earlier that year and then the jets went into foxborough and knocked them off under the on the way to an afc championship game against the steelers but I think if you look at this at a week by week basis, you want to you generally in the playoffs want to play the team that has worse quarterback play and a worse defense. And I, I have nothing against Matt Moore, Cameron Waken, and Dominican Sue. Matt Moore is one of my favorite backups in the NFL. If you want to think of that, I've always respected him as a player. But looking at the way the Chiefs have played, there's no doubt in my mind that they're a much better team than the one we saw at Heinz Field in Week Four. And I think you can expect the Steelers to uh, be excited to have another chance to stop Jay Ajayi. And the way I see Matt Moore is that he's a, I guess, a poor man's version of Alex Smith. And I also really like Alex Smith, too. But I just think the combination of the backup quarterback in Miami, plus the fact that the Chiefs pass rush has been better this year, 
I think that makes the Chiefs a more dangerous opponent to face in the first round. However, at the same point, if you want to look a little further, the Steelers winning would put them in a road game against the number two seed. Now, there are several scenarios of who the two seed could be. It could be the New England Patriots if they lose and the Raiders win. It could be the Raiders, or it could be the Chiefs too. One thing I definitely wouldn't want to see as a Steelers fan is obviously playing the Patriots would not be good, but more specifically, I wouldn't want to see the Steelers go into Kansas City uh, and play the Chiefs on uh, in the divisional round. I think they definitely match up better with, obvi- with the Raiders, obviously with uh, Matt McGloin starting instead of Derek Carr. But if you're going to face the Chiefs, you definitely don't want to play them on the road. Playing them at home is definitely key. So if I had to choose between playing the Dolphins at home and then the Chiefs on the road the next round or just playing the Chiefs in round one at home, I'd definitely prefer to see the Chiefs at home. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, with those thoughts, Austin? Oh, I com- completely agree. I factor that in as well because that's the loudest stadium in the NFL. Well, maybe the 12th man has overtaken it, but it's still one of the loudest stadiums. They're, they always go back and forth with Seattle. I, I'll just say that they're the loudest in the AFC. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, the Steelers lost in Kansas City last year. While, of course, Landry Jones made his first career start in that game, it's still worth noting that they did lose that game. Now, we just talked about injuries to Derek Carr and Ryan Tannehill. With the injuries to those key players, this is the how it's shaping up to be in the AFC with quarterbacks. You've got two great ones in Tom Brady and Ben Roethlisberger. You had a decent one in Alex Smith and then... Wow, look at this. Listen to this. You got Tom Savage, who just made his first career start for the Texans. I love him because he's a former Pitt uh, product, but I don't know (laughs) if he's going to be able to win a playoff game. You've got Matt Moore, who's a backup, and you've got Matt McGloin, who I remember, I think he went to Penn State, but, geez, I didn't know he was a backup quarterback. I think of him as a third-string quarterback. Does that mean the Steelers have a clear path to the Super Bowl? Do you think the Steelers can make it to the Super Bowl? And do you think that the uh, destiny matchup in the AFC Championship game is Pittsburgh and New England? So, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that losing Derek Carr for the Raiders is huge, especially if the seeding stays how it is. Because right now the seeding is perfect, but I really hope the Raiders don't lose. Uh, it, it, it might be a lot to ask by a Matt McGloin-led team, but uh, if seating remains the same, the Steelers would move on to see the Raiders in the second round. And without Derek Carr, the team MVP probably, it isn't really a scary game. It isn't as scary as it could have been. And, I, and that could mean the Steelers are making it to the AFC Championship easy breezy, assuming that the Dolphins or the Chiefs don't give us a problem along the way. But... That's, that's where the problem lies. The Pats are always a problem. And if seating does change, if the Pats really lose this next game and become the second seed, it's really going to really hurt us. Because I'd rather see them in the AFC Championship than right in the first uh, second round. Absol- is, wait, absolutely. is wild card considered first round? Or mm-hmm. Yeah, the wild card is the first considered? round. Okay, I didn't know if it was, if it was something different, but... Uh, it doesn't matter if Tom Brady were to miraculously get hurt before the game. The Patriots, will, Patriots, Patriots will always be the biggest threat because Bill Belichick turns boys into men. I don't know what he's got like some secret potion going on in his basement or something. I don't know that he just makes everyone he's around good. But uh, the Patriots are really in the Steelers' path to their Super Bowl. While I think the Steelers could beat them in the championship, I'm just unsure because it, the last time. We obviously versed the uh, Patriots earlier this year, but it was by a Landry Jones-led team. But what we can take from that is it was, I believe, 30-15. to 15. Fact check me if I'm wrong. But 30-15 to 15 is a pretty close score. And from what I remember, there was a missed kick. There was, there was a bunch of stuff that went wrong. Like the Steelers shot themselves in the foot. So I think it's a, a winnable game. It's just I don't know if it, if it is going to turn out that way. What do you think? My internet is uh, failing me right now for whatever reason, but I don't think it was 30 to 15. It was uh, something different than that. You want to go check that out if uh, you want. Yep. Um, it's uh, 27 to 16, even closer. It was 9 yeah. point. 
My point difference. Uh, 11, 27, 16. <laughs> I can't do math. That's all good. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So for the entire year, at least on the AFC side, it's been the Patriots and everyone else. Um, with injuries and ineffective play of pa- impacting other AFC playoff teams, I think generally I don't like looking big picture for the playoffs. You want to look uh, one game at a time, especially with the Steelers seeming to drop uh, games that they should win every now and then. But it seems like the Steelers and Patriots are on a collision course in the AFC championship game, assuming the seeding stays the way it is. While it's obviously difficult to predict the playoffs with the weak quarterbacks in the AFC, I think it seems likely to assume that the AFC championship game is going to be the Patriots and Steelers. The Steelers have never beaten a Tom Brady-led team in Foxborough, and obviously the Patriots are going to be favored, but obviously it's an anything-can-happen kind of game. It could also be a legacy game where, if you want to think Tom Brady is the best quarterback in football, this could be the game where maybe Ben Roethlisberger takes the torch away from him in this game. Obviously, this is a long time from now, and the Steelers have more important business to take care of first, but it's an interesting thing to think about, something we can maybe discuss at length, or at a greater length, in a couple weeks. Uh, Moving on to other news and notes around the NFL, um, I'm sure you heard about former Steelers quarterback Terry Bradshaw and his comments on Mike Tomlin. What were your thoughts on that? Uh, I felt like what he said could be applied to himself. I think that he was salty about it. Uh, he was a co- good quarterback, but not a great one. Like The question is, would he have been able to take the team to Super Bowl if it weren't for that defense? It's a, often a question brought brought up against him that he isn't that great, and I think he's a little salty about it, so he wanted to put the thoughts on someone else. But anyway, uh, I actually like the comments. Not because of what he said. I don't agree with it. It's because it pissed the team off. Uh, Castro already said he, uh, that the team is pissed off about it, and uh, if the team ends up winning winning it all after he said it, Bradshaw's going to have to eat his words for a long time, and I like that they're going to play pissed off for the coach. So, uh, what do you think? Did you see Vince Williams' tweet about it? I did not. I may have retweeted it on our account, but he said, uh, he said, like, not bad for a, uh, a cheerleader. Um... <laughs> Anyway, Tomlin, res- Tomlin responded today. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Terry Bradshaw, but I think I actually heard something else on the radio today that is an interesting, uh, an interesting take on it. Uh, in Terry Bradshaw's career, he had a, a very business-like coach in Chuck Knoll, someone who really wasn't, I don't know if affectionate's the right word, but he really didn't care about you, I guess. He was, he was so concerned about winning that he, it, wasn't like, it wasn't like he didn't care, but like... He wasn't concerned about how Terry felt on a lot of things. So I think Terry often felt hurt by that, and he was hurt a lot by the way the fans treated him when he didn't play well early in his career. And uh, the comment I heard was Bradshaw would have loved to play under Mike Tomlin, someone who's considered the quote-unquote player's coach. And maybe he's jealous, maybe he's salty, I don't know what it is, but... He definitely, as a four-time Super Bowl winner, whether or not you want to say the Steelers' uh, defense carried him, I don't always agree with that based on what I've seen from that. I think he he has two Super Bowl MVPs for a reason. You don't do that on accident. But at the same time, I don't think it needed to be said. It's, It's just it's perplexing that he said he identifies more with Cower and he doesn't know anything about Mike Tomlin, yet why is he criticizing him? It just, it confuses me a little bit. And I just, it just shows to me that he's still upset with the way he was treated when he played for the Steelers. And he did have a right to be upset at the time, but it's been a long time now. It's time to move on. And uh, I feel a little bad for him, but, you know, it is what it is. And you know what? Maybe more above him eating his own words maybe it's a good thing that he said that. Maybe if this galvanizes the team, maybe it's, I don't know, I I, I wouldn't want to say maybe like thank him for saying that, but maybe it's a turning point for this team because I I don't know. I just, I think it's a, it could be a potentially momentum swinging thing for the team. It seems to have brought them together. And 
moving on to a different subject, we've talked about this a couple times this year. Is Mike Tomlin a good coach, in your opinion, or is he a great coach? disrespect him but I don't think he isn't a I, he isn't a great coach he's definitely a really good one he's gone to three Super Bowls and won two with the two. team he's already, two, two and one, one. He's, he's gone to two, two one one, one. Um, I, why did I think of the 2000 as he didn't come that early uh, uh, he has a record of correct me if I'm wrong uh, .653 he's never had a losing season his worst seasons are 8-8 eight eight. like we could have way worse. We could have had Jeff Fisher for the past 10 years. Like, he's a really good coach. I mean, it's not the fact that he can't be great. It's just being great is such a – it's it's like an elite word. It's There's not many elite coaches. There, it's just – it's a very small group. Like, Belichick is definitely one of that – part of that group. But it's not a big set of people. Like, you can't – It's it's like – I, I, I don't explain it because I think in terms of what Mike Tomlin in, is, he's better. But it's like when you call Joe Flacco elite. It's like he's not elite. But I think it, it's a bad comparison because Joe Flacco is worse as a quarterback than I think of Mike Tomlin as a coach. But I see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. It's just you can't call every single coach the, a great coach. He's a very good one, but not a great one. What do you think? I think if you're talking about <laughs> NFL head coaches, I think you can only call one great, and that's Bill Belichick. His record and playoff success speaks, speaks for itself. I mean, looking at other coaches, I, I just have a list in front of me of current active head coaches with the most uh, wins. You have Marvin Lewis, who in my opinion is a decent coach. Mike McCarthy's a good coach. Mike Tomlin's a good coach. Sean Payton's a good coach, I guess. John Harbaugh's a good coach. Pete Carroll might be the only other coach I could say would be great. But I'm not a huge fan of his anyways. I think Jason Garrett, well, they talked about firing Jason Garrett for three years. You look around the league, there's a bunch of good coaches. I think there's one great coach. Tomlin even said it earlier today that uh, great coaches are guys like Belichick or if you want to look at the NBA, Greg Popovich, someone who's won five NBA titles. You're great when you when you do it five times or four times. But... I can understand why people are frustrated with him. The same people who are ripping Bradshaw were ripping Tomlin when the Steelers were 4-5 and five and were looking like they were going to be struggling for the rest of the year. And I can understand their frustration because we've talked about it at length at times, his often questionable game, uh, game time decisions, whether it's going for two when he probably shouldn't or making strange personnel decisions, but... Overall, if you look at Tomlin's body of work, this will this is now next week will finish his tenth regular season with the Steelers. Seven of those ten years they've gone to the playoffs, zero losing seasons, something that uh his predecessor Bill Cower couldn't say. And obviously Chuck Knoll was a little different uh for his situation. He was taking over a team that hadn't had never won. But at the same time, I think you have to give Mike Tomlin his due, even if he doesn't make the best decisions when it comes to clock management and things like that. His overall body of work makes him a really good coach. And I really hate the argument that the Super Bowl he won was because of what Bill Cowher did. I just think that's a stupid argument. I don't know why people use it. Yeah, it's the players that Cowher had, but so what? If you have all of your own players, what, you know, what are you going to do as soon as you sign as the new coach? You're going to cut everybody? You're not going to do that. That's stupid. So, I mean, I just hate that uh, personally. And if you look at the Steelers, they don't fire their coaches. The last three coaches they've had since 1969, not all three of them have won 100-plus games. They've all won championships. And uh, some a team like the Cleveland Browns or even like the Buffalo Bills maybe could learn from this. The Bills, having a few hours ago just fired Rex Ryan, uh, are going to finish at worst n- seven and nine, uh, looking at an eight and eight season uh, potentially too. Uh, the saying in Buffalo is nobody circles the wagon like the Buffalo Bills. And Austin, we got to see them this year. Uh, what do you think about a team like the Bills or like the Browns that hasn't had sustained success for a long time? The Bills have are the only team that hasn't made the playoffs in this millennium. What do you think about? When you see a team that d- does stuff like that, and you have a guy like Mike Tomlin at coach, I think the Steelers are uh, the fans are a little spoiled, don't you think? Yeah, you got to be. 
thankful. The Steelers have had like three coaches over the last uh, sixty years. Is it seventy, eighty? No, no, no. It's um since nineteen sixty nine. So you're coming up on uh uh I guess almost you're coming up on uh what was it fifty years? I think. It's uh, yeah, fifty coming up on fifty years in uh, in the next three years, when when okay. it's twenty nineteen. So we're almost, we're almost at fifty because I can't do quick math, and uh, that's that's incredible. Like the, I think the Browns have gone through twenty three in the last I think since two thousand or something like that. It's just I think they've gone through what? two since we started this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> for a coach like Mike Tomlin. I mean, a lot of people were, are all young, were like, fire him, make bad decisions when we said we were four and five. And he, I think he he is doing just fine. Absolutely. Well, um, moving on to next week, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Steelers have one last game against the Browns, who finally won their first game of the season last week. Good for them. I'm happy to hear that uh, they aren't going to be uh, – uh, that next 0-16 team. But uh, the Steelers don't really have much to play for. They're, it sounds like they're going to be resting their starters, as they probably should. The only major injury that uh, came out of this game was an injury to Robert Golden, who was questionable with an ankle injury. Uh, uh, based on the uh, Mike Tomlin press conference, it sounds like Ben Roethlisberger, Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, Marquise Pouncey are all going to be rested. What are your thoughts on resting players before playoff games like this? Uh, I like it. It's kind of like having a mini first round bye, except we don't have a first round bye. It's giving us a chance to maybe practice a little more and just and just uh, in the game have some rest, or you don't risk hurting Antonio Brown. The Steelers, quote me if I'm wrong, the Steelers have not had Le'Veon Bell in a. Playoff. No, yeah, he's he's, a playoff game. he's never played in a playoff game. He's never exactly, and the Steelers. I don't think they want to risk it by uh, playing against the Browns. Like I, I, I would. There's no reason. So I, I like it. I also like the idea that Tewitt is going to be healthy. Darius Hayward Bay should be ready to go. Uh, Darius Green will hopefully be out of concussion protocol by the end of this week. And it's I, I like the idea of it. What do you think? Um, I definitely can appreciate that stance, and the I, the reason I am a little different on this is because I re- I remember it felt like every year in the mid two thousands the new the sorry the Indianapolis Colts and Peyton Manning always started like thirteen and zero or something like that, and they'd have the first round or sorry the first round by and home field advantage wrapped up by week 14 or something crazy like that. So then they'd take their foot off the gas and they'd start uh, resting their players. And what happened every year, they never made the Super Bowl. The one year they did did make the Super Bowl, they played out their starters until the end. I'm not saying the Steelers should, you know, start guys like Bell. I think Le'Veon Bell uh, should definitely not be uh, playing in this game at all. Somewhat, I wanted to see something different. I want to see see something similar to a preseason game where the starters outside of maybe Bell or Brown play for maybe like a drive or a quarter uh, at the most two drives. And I just want to see see them stay in rhythm, make sure that they uh, they aren't getting a little rusty. And I know that might be a little, a little weird or I guess a little um, odd, but I just think, I just remember seeing those Colts teams uh, just not playing their players at all. And I just remember all too well, all the times they got knocked out. Yeah. Maybe that's, uh, excuse me. Maybe that's, uh, unrelated, but at the same point, I, I do worry about that yet. I now knowing that they are likely going to be, uh, sitting Roethlisberger and all the guys I mentioned before, I'm looking forward to seeing Landry Jones. Who knows? Maybe have a career game against the Browns or see, D'Angelo Williams shake off some of the rust a little bit, maybe play, like I said, the first couple drives. I want to see a little bit more of what DeMarcus Ayers can do. I was excited by what I saw from the two plays he was involved in last week. I like Fitzgerald Toussaint. I want to see him get some more playing time. 
who knows, maybe if Sammy Coates is recovered, maybe we can see him actually get through, get, you know, maybe seven targets or something, but, uh, you know, we probably aren't going to learn much about, about the team from this game, but the key is staying healthy. Don't play anybody that's got an injury that they're dealing with and see if the depth guys can show us something. Um, that's what I have to say about it. But before we wrap this, uh, this podcast up, we were talking about this game, the Steelers Ravens game, this classic Steelers Ravens finish. So if you have, if you had a top five list, a brief top five list of your favorite Raven Steelers memories, what would they be, Austin? Uh, well, and I'm, I think we both did it in no particular order, but uh, in no particular order, this game was definitely in it because this was definitely the biggest one. And I, I just, I, I want to say, I wasn't always the biggest fan. I, I kind of watched on and off in my earlier years when I was a kid, so I might not have the best memory, but. Uh, Charlie Batch coming in and winning it was that number two. I believe it was in 2013, and it was that that was a great game. Charlie Batch is crying at the end, and it, it had me emotional. I was like, oh, oh, good for him. And then um, Ro- Roethlisberger's second game against the Ravens. That was his first win against the Ravens, and uh, it was good. Joe Flacco wasn't there yet, so <laughs> it was a it was a different time, but. Uh, the 2008 AFC Championship is definitely in there. Yeah, I can't for, forget that. That's a really good one. That was that was a really great game. And then uh, 2014 six touchdown performance by Roethlisberger is definitely in there too because that was incredible. When you usually talk about the Ravens Steelers game, it's like oh it's hard hitting. It's a defensive matchup. Nope. Roethlisberger came in and threw just six touchdowns out and right after throwing six touchdowns against the Colts the previous week. It was just a really great game. Uh, how about you? What's your top five Raven uh, Steelers moment? You know that game in 2014 is kind of what I thought the Steelers should try to do in this uh, in this game. They obviously didn't end up doing that, but uh, this game is definitely the top of the list for me. I already mentioned how it was so incredible being at that game, being there with my mom. That's definitely the top memory for any Steelers Ravens game that I've ever seen. And then in no particular order after that, I have the 2010 Steelers win on the road on Sunday night football in 2010 when Haloti Nata broke Ben Roethlisberger's nose, the Troy Polamalu strip sack, and uh, the Isaac Redmond go-ahead touchdown to take control of the division from that point. That was another big-time game. You've got the AFC Championship game, as we already talked about. I actually have that game on DVD. I've seen it probably like 15 times at least. It's uh, one of the most physical games I've ever seen, and it was definitely a huge punctuation mark on that Steelers season leading to another Super Bowl championship with Troy Polamalu's pick six. And then you have the AFC Divisional game, one that I remember more fondly simply because I followed the 2010 team more than I followed the 2008 team. That that game was a tale of two halves. The Steelers were down 21-7 at... Uh, halftime Sean Sweesom who had missed one kick all regular season missed one in that game and uh, you really didn't feel good but uh, going into the second half but then Ray Rice fumbled for the first time in like 400 touches the Steelers get a touchdown then a Joe Flacco interception leads to another touchdown and then Antonio Brown makes his first uh, first impact in the postseason that we uh, had ever seen Uh, deep pass I think it was like a 40 or 50 yard catch on a third and 19 uh, where he pinned the ball to his helmet like David Tyree that set up the game-winning score. That was definitely a huge memory for me. And then finally, you mentioned the Charlie Batch game. Th- this game didn't really have uh, much implications in the uh, while in the playoff races. The Steelers missed the playoffs that year. The Ravens went on to win the Super Bowl that year. But in that game, the Steelers had been scuffling and they uh, they were missing Ben Roethlisberger and Byron Leftwich, and Charlie Batch had just thrown three interceptions on the road where the Steelers had turned the ball over eight times in Cleveland. And you really didn't have a lot of confidence going into this game. A lot of people said it's time for Batch to retire, and he didn't have the best game in the world, but he played well when it mattered most. And I just remember him sitting in the pocket on that last drive, making a big-time completion to Mike Wallace that set up the game-winning field goal. And I remember just being so happy for him after that game, that which ended up being his final career start. That was definitely another big time memory and a lot of great memories just from our side alone. 
on what's probably the best modern day uh, football rivalry, uh, don't you think? Oh yeah. Um, before we conclude this, I had one last thing we wanted to get to: the color rush uniforms. Wow, those those looked better than I thought. I I wasn't sure how I was feeling. The jerseys were pretty similar to the Steelers' seventy fifth anniversary jerseys, which they wore in two thousand seven, but the uh, pants had a nice yellow stripe on the side. And the it, they just looked really good. What do you think about the uniforms, Austin? I I really like the uniforms. Uh, I didn't really think I liked them at first, to be honest. But uh, then I think the pants really made. It. I like the yellow stripe. If the pants are just black. I don't, I don't think I would have liked it as much. It just looks super mean and intimidating. You know, that's pretty much exactly what my mom and I said when we got to uh, our seats and we looked. The first time, I, the first person I saw was Chris Boswell because we had gotten there and like only the specialists were warming up, and I thought, you know, th- those look pretty cool. But then the more and more I saw them as warm ups started, and you know the game started, I just the more I saw it, the more I liked it. And then when I got home and we watched the uh, replay of the game, God, if they, I, I, I don't think they would, but if they made that their new alternate uniform, I'd be very happy with that. And you're absolutely right. Those The stripe on the side of the pants was the big uh, difference maker for me. If I had one complaint, one minor complaint, <clears throat> the Steelers have numbers on their helmets. I would have liked to see the numbers uh, that are double digits because single digits go inside the stripe on top of the helmet. The ones that are double digit, I would have liked to see have yellow numbers instead of white because the white seemed a little weird. But then again, you're talking about something that's about three square inches of a football helmet, so it's not really that big of a deal. Overall, a great uniform. I was happy to see uh, see see them look good under... You talk about a lot of color rush uniforms that don't look that great, thinking of just specifically the Jaguars and how theirs look kind of like diarrhea. <laughs> uh, anyways, is there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap things up, Austin? Uh, yeah, I was kind of thinking about it because... Uh, we, we, you talked about it a little while ago, but I, it was, it's been thinking in my head, going in my head. I kind of hope Landry Jones doesn't have a good game. I, oh. I mean, I don't want to lose because I feel like it's a momentum killer, even if it's backups. I, I don't like the idea. But I don't want the Steelers to even have the thought of re-signing him this offseason. I don't, I don't want him to come in and like throw four touchdowns and just have a great day, and then the Steelers are like, huh. Maybe we should resign him. I, I want him to definitely leave in the off season. I mean, I hope I don't. I, the Steelers will probably not be able to afford it anyway. But I don't want there to even be the thought because I'm not. I'm not a Landry Jones fan. Well, let me put it this way uh, for you: for someone who has not been a Landry Jones fan since he was in college, um, we want him to have the biggest game of his life. You know why? You remember who had the biggest game of his life for uh, the Detroit, or sorry, the Green Bay Packers a few years ago? Matt Flynn. You know what happened after that? Signed to the Seahawks for a huge amount of money. What did he do after that? Nothing. Russell Wilson took his spot. So, yes. You know what? Go, go ahead. Have a day, Landry Jones. You know what? It'd be great for him to have a great day. The Steelers are probably not going to re- re-sign him anyways. But if he has a career game like that, well, maybe the Cleveland Browns will sign him. Who knows? But I I really don't I, I really don't think it's gonna matter much even if he does have a career game because even even if he does, people are gonna say, Oh, he played the Browns. But in all seriousness, I think if he has a, a career game, it's possible you could see someone at, give him a crazy offer, but I, I don't think you're gonna see anything like Matt Flynn and I really don't think the Steelers are gonna re sign him no matter what. I think Zach Mettenberger is the backup of this team going forward. I hope anyways. I like Zach Mettenberger as far as uh, the prospect of a backup. Mm-hmm. It's probably time to draft the quarterback, too, in the draft or start thinking about it, like, late. Yeah. They just pick up one that's in the small, so the sixth round, not someone you don't expect to do anything, just to kind of – just to have him. Are you saying you're not talking about Ben Roethlisberger's replacement, are you? Uh, I, I would start thinking about it because even though Ben is on a five year or is it, it's five years, but I don't know if he's only got four years left. I think he'll have uh, four after this year or I, I think it's four after this year. I could be wrong. It could, the extension could kick in next season. Okay. Well, regardless, I don't know if he'll make it that far 
because obviously Roethlisberger has suffered a lot of uh, small injuries in his career. He's never been out for an entire season, only been parts of a season, but those add up, and obviously he was hit so much early on in his career. I think it's time to start at least thinking about it because you can't pretend like it's not going to happen forever. It's, it's just time to start at least doing a tiny bit of looking. I uh, I can I can appreciate where you're coming from. The one thing that's interesting to note is that this year he's probably since he's it's looking like he's not going to play. He's going to set a career low for sacks, breaking last year's personal record where he only got sacked 20 times. This year you're only looking at 17 times. In fact, what I think he got sacked one time in this winning streak. It's uh, oh no, he got sacked twice, two or three times. But in any case, you're definitely right. I, I don't know if this is the year to do it. The other thing is that drafting quarterbacks is definitely an interesting uh, interesting animal because if you don't take a quarterback in the first round, there usually isn't one that's taken. I mean, yeah, maybe there's one or two that's taken in rounds two or three, but then you usually don't draft a quarterback till the fifth or sixth round. So I don't know much about the quarterback draft class, but I think it's definitely important for the Steelers to start maybe thinking about it but I think maybe wait one more year and then kind of evaluate it from there. But that's just my personal opinion on it. So uh, anything else you wanted to add, Austin, before we wrap this up? Nope, that should be it. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Uh, We hope you all had a wonderful and Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah and Happy Holidays. Um, We'll be recording another... uh, preview show probably before the end of the new year so we'll wish everyone a happy new year then uh if you have any feedback or questions or want to email us uh we're at stronger than steel podcast at gmail.com uh we have youtube soundcloud facebook and twitter pages uh our facebook and twitter handles are sts podcast one we are just called stronger than steel podcast on soundcloud and youtube Go check out SoundCloud for our uh, up-to-date and quick uh, uploaded video, up, uploaded videos and audio. We upload there first. Then we go to YouTube for our complete collection. And uh, Austin, I don't know why, but I just started an Instagram page for some reason. Just bored. I don't know. Maybe we can just post pictures of Steelers players or something. I, I really don't know what I was doing, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's something we can do. Because I actually don't even have an Instagram account for myself so because i don't use instagram so that that's on you if you want to do stuff yeah i don't know what i was thinking but you know we'll see maybe i'll make something out of it but anyways ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us today and we'll uh we'll talk to you next week and uh congratulations to the pittsburgh steelers 2016 afc north champions take care everybody